we are uh, doing the AA history and i um, pretty excited to have have Rick uh, F here from Pensacola, Florida. My, uh, my sponsor uh, was all over me about trying to get Rick to do this next time we got to this part of the book. Uh, so I'm going to try to shut up and give Rick as much time <laughs> as, as he needs. Uh, so Rick, the, uh, the meeting's yours. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Steve. My name is Rick. I'm an alcoholic. Really honored to be asked to make a presentation to a group of big book students. I love the textbook. I love the program recovery that it contains. And I also love most of the people in the fellowship that attend it. <laughs> uh, it's really, it's really great to be uh, a part of a study group and uh, this presentation, it's a PowerPoint slideshow presentation of the history of AA. It's only vignettes. Um, it's way too much ground to cover. So it, it focuses a lot on uh, what Steve asked me about, about the forwards, the prefaces, the, uh, the historical background, uh, to try to lay down a, um, a background to make the next pass through the book and uh, to try to make it relevant. Uh, it will not be a museum tour. This is not going to be a museum tour. It's, it's designed to be focused on about bringing out the principles, uh, not so much who had freckles, but what they brought to us. And um, I'll do my best to be accurate on it, but I'm certainly no expert. And uh, I'll do a preemptive 10 step on any errors that I make. It'll be by omission, not commission, that's for sure. Uh, but there have been many contributors to this um, to this slideshow, and uh, two primaries were, of course, uh, Frank Mauser, who was retired from GSO as the archivist there. Uh, Frank was responsible for providing me with a lot of this information, and also my now um, deceased sponsor, uh, Charlie Parmley from Joe and Charlie Big Book Study. Charlie raised me in AA, and and instilled in me a deep respect and uh, and a hunger for the uh, the background of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I will, without further ado, we'll uh, launch into the uh, into the presentation. Um, All right, presentation of the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. And of course, the core of Alcoholics Anonymous is uh, presented in this watercolor uh, about the man on the bed and the sober members reaching out and carrying the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. I like to start out with the first edition, first printing big book, Big Red as it's known in some circles. Without this, we would not be here. This has been the anvil that the AA experience has been hammered out on and it provides us uh, continuity, consistency, and, and an objective place to, to look for if we have questions regarding what the true program of recovery is. It was written by this gentleman. This is Bill Wilson. Um, Bill was um, the undisputed founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Several other people later on were bestowed with uh, honorary titles of co-founders, but Bill's the author of the textbook. And uh, he's the one that that, that actually um, made the beginning for us and authored our textbook. In Bill's story, he talks about wartime. It was World War I, and he wandered into Winchester Cathedral, and he felt the presence of God. And when you look at this picture, it's a pretty impressive sight. It's, it's um, uh, pretty awe-inspiring. And whenever he walked outside, he saw the tombstone of the Hampshire Grenadier. Here's the first of many. Uh, coincidences are, uh, as uh, Joe Mack used to say, is that odd or is that God? The uh, Hampshire Grenadier was a man named Thomas Thatcher. It's an English spelling with an E instead of an A. And years later, Bill is approached by Ebby Thatcher, uh, uh, a former drinking friend of his that uh, they had gotten sober through the Oxford Group's uh, rescue mission. So uh, that's one of first of many, many coincidences. And uh, Bill had an incredible memory. It's interesting that he uh, was able to regurgitate so much of what he read off of this tombstone, uh, where he talks about 
that uh, he caught his death by drinking cold small beer uh, and uh, an honest soldier has never forgot whether he dies by musket or by pot. Whether he dies by pot is not a, uh, any type of impeachment on AA singleness of purpose. Okay. He wasn't saying they're not trying to say he smoked himself to death. This was uh, back in the 1700s. It's before they invented pitchers. So instead of a pitcher of beer, they would set a pot of beer on the uh, bar and they would dip out of it. Uh, but this was a ominous warning, which Bill failed to heed. The next important part of our AA history and background is Leonard Strong. Leonard Strong was married to Bill's sister, Dorothy. And uh, Leonard made an important uh, contribution to AA on many, many levels. One was helping keep Bill alive through uh, bankrolling his trip to detox at uh, Towns Hospital. He also brokered a uh, meeting with the Rockefeller Foundation uh, through Willard Richardson and uh, an acquaintance of his that had taught him in a Bible study many years prior. And Leonard Strong also served as his non-alcoholic trustee whenever the foundation that later became GSO came about. So he's a tremendous servant uh, service to AA and an important part of our history. This is Dr. William D. Silkworth. They called him Silky. He was the little doctor that loved drunks. His importance cannot be overemphasized. He was a neurologist. He studied the functions of the brain. He was all set to have his own hospital or clinic for neurology and the stock market crashed and he wound up having to take a job working for Charles Towns at Towns Hospital but he had a keen insight into the workings of alcoholics. And he provided us with his opinion, which was later proved out scientifically, that there was some physiology involved, that there was something physically different about alcoholics uh, that once we started to drink, he called it the phenomenon of craving uh, would kick in and we would actually drink against our will. This is Charles uh, Towns Hospital, it's Towns Hospital in New York City. And if you'll note, this is no ghetto, um, you know, uh, free clinic type of thing. It is actually on one of the borders of Central Park, which is a fairly exclusive part of New York, even at that time. And it was there that uh, he was uh, employed by this gentleman, Charles Towns, a, um, a layman, if you will, from Georgia. And Charles Towns played an important part in Alcoholics Anonymous, especially for us big book lovers, because he loaned us money to get the big book published. They were struggling mightily trying to get the book published, and Charles Towns facilitated, helped facilitate in uh, funding of getting the big book published. Now, that's not to say he wasn't without his own personal agenda. He also wanted to, uh, he approached Bill about being a lay counselor there and selling the book and the program through his treatment center. Uh, this was one of the first uh, examples of where the group conscience entered in and the group told Bill, you can't commercialize this and you can't sell it. Uh, but Tar Charles Towns was important to us as far as uh, getting Bill not only dried out and sober, but also it was critical that he overstepped and, and voided his, one of his primary rules was, once you clear Towns Hospital and your detox procedure, you do not come back unless you go through the admissions process and pay your money. There was no alumni association or any aftercare or anything like that. And in Bill's case, he's the only one that, that Towns allowed to come back and speak with the residents there, with the patients, the clientele. So, uh, he gave Silkworth the okay for Bill to come back and speak with uh, um, the clients there at his hospital, which was the beginning of reaching out. And actually, before we were at it, uh, hospital and treatment work. This is Knickerbocker Hospital in, in New York, where uh, Dr. Silkworth finished out his, uh, his professional career. He treated many, many alcoholics there. This gentleman, his name is Seber Graves. He was a member of the Oxford groups and um, he, the men's squad, if you will. And Sebra, along with this gentleman on this slide here on the far left, that is Roland Hazard. 
uh, Roland is, is listed in, uh, there is a solution about the person that went to um, treatment for a year in Zurich, Switzerland, and was under the care of Dr. Carl Jung, the celebrated psychiatrist. Now, when Roland and Sieber went before the judge, Abby Thatcher was in trouble again, and he was about to be committed for alcoholic insanity. It just so happened that Sieber's father was the judge sitting on the bench, and uh, they he agreed to let Abby be released to their care and custody, and they eventually wound up getting him back up to New York City, and they plugged him into the Oxford Group's rescue mission that was in the Bowery of um, of New York uh, City, and that's where Ebby was able to make his start. This is Carl Jung. He's the one that's listed in our book that Roland Hazard was attended to. Carl Jung is super important in our history because uh, when Roland Hazard was going to be uh, treated or when his family had plenty of money and they were offering, they wanted him to have the best counseling money could buy. Sigmund Freud was old. He was not accepting any new patients. Uh, his right arm man, Carl Adler, was in Germany and he was ill at the time. So Carl Jung was the next man up. And it's such a blessing to us because of those three, Freud, Adler, and Jung, Carl Jung was the only one that believed in God. And he tried to use some of his uh, psychology and psychiatry techniques uh, with Roland. Uh, but it was to no avail. One of the greatest quotes that Carl Jung gave to us that has kind of gotten brushed aside was, one of his sayings was, believe until you know. And that was critical to the underpinnings of Alcoholics Anonymous because we embraced a movement that was going on in the early 1900s called experimental and experiential faith. And uh, the, you know, try out the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet and that we would acquire spirituality through our own experiences with it, not having it pressed upon us from outside people. And he described that very well in his, in his book, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. He was basically saying that it's a disconnect. It's being disconnected from God, the spiritual malady he was describing. And that once the spiritual malady is overcome, obviously we straighten out mentally and physically. But Carl Jung was a big advocate that uh, there was disintegration from the man and from the higher power. And that was the source of uh, a lot of our grief. This gentleman is Frank Buckman. Frank Buckman was a minister and uh, he has particular ties to Princeton, New Jersey, as a matter of fact. Uh, Frank Buckman had uh, an innate God-given ability to bring people to what they called a conversion experience, converting from self-will to God's will. And early in his career, he was at Princeton University and working with college students. And he was trying to get them to open up about defects of character. And one of his techniques was to talk about sexual indiscretions. and. Uh, there were some pious leaders in charge of uh, Princeton at that time that intervened and said, uh, you're uninvited from our campus, Frank. We're not really interested in having somebody here that's going to try to get our, um, our student body to open up about their sex lives or sexual indis indiscretions. And that, of course, was not Buckman's thrust. It was just a technique he was trying to use to get people to uh, lay claim to defects of character and uh, and as they called it at that time, the sins. But Frank Buckman is very important in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, he went on from Princeton uh, across the Great Pond and wound up over in Oxford uh, University. And that's where they kind of coined the phrase the Oxford groupers because he used some, he went on to, uh, to use Oxford as a base. This is Frank Buckman's right arm man, Samuel Moore Shoemaker. He was the director at the Calvary Episcopal Church in New York City. Bill Wilson made no bones whatsoever about saying that Sam Shoemaker basically was his mentor that taught him what later became the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Sam 
was very gifted in terms of teaching spiritual principles and he was very valuable to us. Now at his church, they had an interest in alcoholics. They had, here's a picture of the Calvary Episcopal Church. And uh, they did have a passion for the plight of alcoholics, but they weren't real excited about having uh, the drunks in their church, at least the gutter bums. And so they funded and they were the source of this rescue mission that I referenced earlier about Abby Thatcher being taken to to uh, make his start and learn these principles of the Oxford groups. As a sidebar, if you ever are up there visiting, there is a stained glass window uh, at the Calvary Episcopal Church dedicated by the Hazard family in the memory of, memory of Roland Hazard. And uh, it was one of the alliterative illusions that alcoholism is much like stained glass. To be properly understood, it has to be viewed from the inside. You can look at it from the outside and get some kind of an idea, but to get the true insight into stained glass as well as alcoholism, it needs to really be viewed from the inside out. Here's a picture of Bill Wilson on the left and Ebby Thatcher on the right. Edwin Throckmorton Thatcher. His family uh, was centered in Albany, New York. They were a fairly prestigious family. They had a foundry business. His grandfather, his uncle, as well as Abby's brother, all three at different times had been mayor of the city of New York or of Al Albany. And Abby was in exile down in Vermont whenever he had that latest brush with the law when they were going to lock him up <laughs> uh, because he was an embarrassment to the family. His alcoholism was full blown. He was kind of the Billy Carter of the family, you know, the outlaw brother that just needs to be kind of kept out of public view. And so they had him exiled in Vermont. And that's where he hit that bottom where he went before the judge. And then the sequence of events led to Roland and Seabra Graves and another fellow named Shep Cornell getting him plugged in up in New York at the rescue mission where they began to teach him the principles of the Oxford groups and Abby was sober. Now, in Bill's story, he talks about he was out in Akron, Ohio. They were trying to uh, do a hostile uh, proxy fight for a stock takeover of a company called National Rubber Machinery related to the tire building business in Akron. And it failed miserably, and Bill was at the turning point. He hears in the background the bar, the glass and the ices, the laughter, and the thought occurs to him, maybe I could go in and, and have a ginger ale and scrape an acquaintance. But he has a moment of clarity. This is another one of those crises, those turning points in Alcoholics Anonymous background and history. Uh, he finally realized it came to Bill that alcoholics don't do, go to the bar to drink soft drinks. <laughs> they go to the bar to drink alcohol. And he realized he was on the verge of a slip. So instead, he went over to the church directory and he wound up being in touch with this man, the Reverend Walter Tunks. And Tunks was the Reverend. He was the rector of the Episcopal Church in Akron. And he quizzed him about Oxford Group Connections because that was Bill's lifeline, his source of sobriety at the time. And Tunks says, oh, yeah, we've had the Oxford Groups here in 1933. Uh, this is a, um, it, it's a front page picture off of when the Oxford Groups held a week-long dinner jacket revival in Akron. Uh, seated there, you see Frank Buckman, uh, the leader and founder of the Oxford Groups. This gentleman uh, that's leaning over his shoulder is Bud Firestone of the Firestone uh, Tire family. And Bud had an issue uh, and had trouble with drinking. And Buckman and his Oxford Groupers had been able to bring uh, Bud to a... Um, to a point where he would have a conversion experience of thy will be done. And, uh, and so the Firestone family was so thrilled about this. They invited uh, Buckman as well as several Oxford groupers to come and do this week long revival in Akron. And so Tunk says, yeah, we've got Oxford group background here. They're still meeting. As a matter of fact, there's a lady that's kind of heading that up and her name is Henrietta Cyberling. And Henrietta had red hair and she was very persistent. Dr. Bob later referred to her as Little Red Hen 
<laughs> because she kept pecking at him about we've got to get something done about this, you know, about your uh, alcohol consumption. So Henrietta was Bill's connection there to the Oxford group. And she was thrilled. She actually called his call a manna, being manna from heaven, that she had been praying uh, for Dr. Bob Smith. And she received guidance that he was not to consume even so much as one drop of alcohol, but they hadn't been able to accomplish that. She sent her driver over and um, Bill, they, uh, they bailed Bill out from uh, his, his bill at the Mayflower Hotel. This is Henrietta's home that she was living in. It's the gatehouse, a uh, little small gatehouse. That's a pretty nice sized gatehouse, if you will, for the Sibling estate. And it was there that uh, she was living and she called her good friend, Ann Smith. And this is Ann Smith on the left and Dr. Bob Smith on the right. Uh, and said, there's a man here from New York and he's sober through the Oxford groups. You've got to get you know, Dr. Bob over here right away. And uh, Anne hemmed and hawed, and finally she had to tell Henrietta, well, he came home drunk, and he's not fit to be coming over. We'll come tomorrow. Uh, two little trivia points for Dr. Bob. He loved the wild hand-painted ties, and he actually had tattoos on one of his forearms that uh, it was kind of a silent testimony to his uh, wilder side because he was a very reserved person. But it was when she brought Dr. Bob over to Henrietta's house when Ann did. Along the ride, he said, I'll give this bird about 15 minutes just out of courtesy to Henrietta. She's prayed for me so much, uh, but then I'm out of here. And that 15 minute talk turned into hours that they did at the study. And it emerged with Dr. Bob making his arrangements and uh, having Bill, if you will, as his sponsor uh, that sponsored him into the uh, the concepts that he had received and worked out so far with only five or six months sober from New York. And that's where we got the combination of Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith. Bill wound up staying some months at, uh, at Ardmore Avenue, where this is where Dr. Bob and Ann Smith lived. And uh, that's where they began to work out the underpinnings of the very first attempts to help other alcoholics. Dr. Bob practiced medicine at the city hospital of Akron. He was a surgeon. He was a rectal surgeon, as a matter of fact. I'm not sure, but I think that maybe uh, that his background in that has helped him be such a really good sponsor. You know, he was used to dealing with, with us. Uh, that was funny in case you missed it. All right. So anyway, they called and, and asked if there was an alcoholic or anyone they could speak to. And uh, the nurse said, yeah, we've got one that's in four point restraints. He's a real corker, all right. He blacked the eyes of one of the nurses. And that's where they made their call with what became AA number three, which was Bill Dodson. Now they had had a couple of attempts prior to this hospital visit that did not work out. But nonetheless, uh, Bill D is, com is commonly referred to as AA number three. In Akron, there was this uh, Catholic nun named Sister Mary Ignatia. And Mary Ignatia was trained as a music teacher. Here's another one of those moments in Alcoholics Anonymous history. She had a breakdown from being a workaholic. She didn't have problems with alcohol, but uh, at the end of her therapy, the therapist told her, you can leave here a live nun or a dead music teacher. And she said, well, what do you mean? He said, you're not going to be able to continue on with uh, teaching music. You need to pick up another um, ministry, if you will, for your talents. And so she took on being a hospital administrator at the Sisters of Charity Mercy Hospital in Akron. This was a really, we struck gold here when this happened, because at this time, hospitals did not allow doctors to admit uh, people for alcoholism. There were two main reasons for this. Number one, there was very little hope of doing anything for us. And number two, we tended to not pay our bills. So Sister Ignatia teamed up with Dr. Bob and they began to set aside some space to where alcoholics could be uh, detoxed and not over some bogus uh, diagnosis of gastritis or things of that sort. 
and um, she was one of the angels that came our way uh, for hospitalization regarding detox. Whenever they would leave her program later, she would give them one of these scapulars. And the scapular is on, this was encased in plastic, but it was on wool. And so it was designed to be itchy as a reminder. And uh, this is a, uh, something that she would give as a token of them completing their detox. And she would tell them, this comes with a string attached. If you decide you want to drink again, that's up to you. But I'd ask that you come back here and return your medallion, your scapular, before you do so. And, of course, she knew that she'd get a chance to have another shot at him and say, Tommy, have you lost your mind? Do I need to remind you what you were like whenever you were here, in here and how you acquired that token of sobriety? So Sister Ignatia is commonly referred to as another one of her comfort, uh, one of her contributions as what later evolved into the chip system or the giving of medallions to, um, to commemorate different lengths of sobriety. And here is the Sisters of Charity uh, Hospital in Akron. Now, the Oxford groups were meeting in this home of T. Henry and Clarice Williams after Buckman and the Oxford groups left before Bell got there. And this is where uh, Dr. Bob and Ann Smith and the early uh, members of the uh, the act, what later became Akron Group, they met there. Now, T. Henry and Clarice were not alcoholic, but they were devoted to the Oxford Group principles, and they opened their home up and saw to it that the Oxford Group uh, meetings carried on up until the point where Bill arrived. Now, here's another one of those oddities. T. Henry w Williams was employed by the National Rubber Machinery Company, and he would have probably been unemployed had Bill's proxy fight been successful. But here he soldiers on in spite of that and keeps the Oxford groups alive till Bill could arrive and hook up with Dr. Bob. It's just amazing. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the Oxford group. They're critical in AA history and our big book, absolutely critical, cannot be overlooked. And this is a book that was written anonymously called What is the Oxford Group? It's a good thing that plagiarism laws were not in place in 1939 when our beloved textbook was printed or we would have probably been in trouble. We lifted a great deal from this What is the Oxford Group book. In the first chapter, the Oxford Group, it, it contains things that later showed up in our preamble. It's not an organization in the conventional sense. There are no dues or fees. You're a member if you say you are. There's no hierarchy or property owned and goes on from there. The second chapter was about what they called sin. We later softened that to defects of character, made it a little bit more palatable. They had sharing for two purposes, for confession, which was normally done in private, and witnessing, which was done more publicly. The next chapter was about surrender. And keep in mind, the Oxford groups aren't focused about alcohol or alcoholism. They're not surrendering to alcohol. They're surrendering self-will to God's will. Restitution, that later became, of course, our steps eight and nine. Made a list and made direct amends. Guidance, how about step 11? Sought through prayer and medication. Excuse me, meditation or art. Then we get to the, thank you, Nancy. We get to the four absolutes. Absolute honesty, purity, unselfish, and love. I can only imagine that the alcoholics attending these meetings said, what an order, I can't go through with it. But these were not things, standards that they were being held to. These were twofold. They were kind of a roundabout way description of attributes of the higher power, for one thing, and that we were trying to try to grow in trying to uh, grow closer to these. The interesting part about the four absolutes is they're divided into two sections that most people don't realize. The first two sections are internal work, honesty with self, purity of thought life. And after that work is done, then we can move on to unselfishness and love. The thing that gets overlooked is it's not possible to be unselfish and loving without having first done the honesty and purity. To convert that to modern AA, 
it's very difficult to skip over the steps and go straight for a service position. <laughs> you can't be a trusted servant <laughs> unless you've uh, done the internal work first. So there's a progression of things. There were two Oxford groups that were very, books that were very uh, well read. One was I Was a Pagan by a man named Kitchen, and another one for Sinners Only by A.J. Russell. A.J. Russell described the, the Oxford group house parties and their techniques that they used, pairing up people with similar problems with someone that had uh, found their solution to that. I Was a Pagan is a very good read about all the false gods and the attempts to sidestep deity uh, by this man. Uh, that he finally had to surrender self-will to thy will be done in order to solve his alcoholism. This is probably my favorite slide of the entire show, and it describes the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous to a T. You see on the upper left, William D. Silkworth. He brought medicine to the table. Now, before AA, medicine hadn't been able to do much for alcoholics. The next one is Carl Jung, and Carl Jung brought psychology or psychiatry philosophy, if you will, to the table. And before Alcoholics Anonymous, they hadn't had much luck with psychiatry of counseling alcoholics sober. Then you get Frank Buckman here, representing religion. And prior to Alcoholics Anonymous, religion hadn't made much of a dent on the age-old problem of alcoholism as well. But when these three influences, medicine, psychiatry, and religion, were brought together with Bill Wilson. That's where AA came from. Bill was more or less a crucible, a melting pot for these three different disciplines that brought them together to produce what we now know as Alcoholics Anonymous. Phenomenal. This was the dust jacket for the first edition big books. They called it the circus jacket. When you look at it closely, there's nothing anonymous about it whatsoever. It was designed to sell books. It wasn't, uh, they were still promoting the sales of the book at that time. The book was written on William Street at the honored dealer's office of Bill Sponsey, Hank Parkhurst. Here's Bill in his accustomed writing style with his Argyle socks kicked back at the desk uh, with his Viceroy's or Chesterfields on the table that later killed him later in life with emphysema complications. But this is where Bill did the writing for the textbook. This is Ruth Hawk. She was the secretary for honor dealers and she typed up uh, the rough drafts and she would, they would circulate them among the members in New York and a few select people in Akron. Actually, there were only two or three. It was an open discussion at the Akron AA groups because they weren't really supportive of the uh, writing and publication of the book. It was packaged with a promotion that Bill tried to ramrod through about having a chain of hospitals and paid missionaries. And that was such a turnoff that they weren't really excited about anything regarding money, regarding uh, our textbook, especially. The, uh, the Akron bunch were Bible thumpers, quite honestly. And they would say things like, you know, the apostles, uh, they did not go around with printed pieces of paper. Why do we need that? You know, let's just follow the, the, um, the biblical underpinnings, but it turned out that Ruth Hawk, she did us a great job as our secretary and typist. And there were times they couldn't pay her. So she took even the bogus stock certificates and payments. Now about the forwards. And I was thrilled to hear it read whenever we started tonight. This is from the first, you know, the, the red book, the first printing first edition. And if you notice, it says, Precisely how we have recovered is in all caps. That was meant to jump off the page. That was meant to draw our attention. This is not approximately. This is not some beta test. This is precisely how we have recovered. He, Bill later goes on and calls them directions. And, and, and so that was something that we look back and it's kind of gotten watered down a little bit. Uh, the books now just say in italics precisely how we've recovered, but we don't want to have the significance of that lost on us today. Those of us that are trying to uh, embrace and pass on full full strength sobriety. 
Also in the first 16 printings of the big book, Dr. Silkworth's name does not appear on the doctor's opinion. And at this time it was considered kind of medical heresy. And uh, so he remained anonymous on the first, first edition big books. But we were given the Lasker Award by the American Public Health Association for pioneering work in the age old problem of alcoholism. It was a very prestigious award. So when the second edition rolled around, Silkworth was just fine with his name being added to uh, his opinion as it was printed in our book. The first letter that came from Dr. Silkworth was actually in July of 1938 before the big book was published. He wrote that at Bill's request to try to open some doors for fundraising for the book. And it was later edited and added to uh, and became uh, part of our book. Here's another important part of AA history and the prefaces and the forwards, okay? Dr. Silkworth's doctor's opinion was page number one. It was always meant to be read first. Always is the foundation. But when the second edition came out, Bill realized that chapter one should be page one. And without knowing it, it kind of diminished the doctor's opinion because it got pushed back into Roman numerals. And that was a problem for drunks like me. I outsmarted myself when I got here. I wanted to skip over all the warm ups, you know, and the, and the, uh, and things of that sort and go straight for page one. And I skipped over the doctor's opinion until I got a hold of a big book teacher that said, no, 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 no. Let's go back to where it starts. So the doctor's opinion, page one, and always meant to be studied first. In the red book, the first printing, first edition, it's the only one that any of the wording of the steps has been changed. The 12th step in the red book said, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. They started getting correspondence and people were saying, I don't, I didn't get that burning bush white light uh, experience that Bill described in his story at the hospital. Am I doing it wrong? And Bill realized that he'd made a mistake. And so when they finally sold the first 4,963 red books and reordered, they got the second printing. And when the second printing came out, he changed experience to awakening. And that's when the appendix came at the back of our book, the spiritual experience or spiritual appendix. I like to say that just to dispel any myths, never did it say in step 12, having had a spiritual experience or awakening as a result of these meetings. It was always as a result of these steps. And so if you missed that, that's funny too. It's really hard to get the feedback on Zoom, but it, it's not about the meetings, it's about the steps, okay? Now the book, whenever World War II came out was cut down in size because paper was on ration. And so the wartime edition was quite a bit smaller, but they kept the same font. They just narrowed the margins and used thinner paper. Here's an example of how the book has evolved over the different printings. The first edition at top left, the second edition came out in 1955. Then 76, we have the third edition and then our current uh, fourth edition big book. I love this picture. Pike gritted in the teeth. Doesn't this guy just look like an atheist? I mean, at first blush, you know, this is Jimmy Burwell. He's the one that was the fly in the ointment in the New York AA uh, early ventures. He demanded that it was God as we understood him because whenever he made his start, he refused. He wanted to be sober as an atheist. Well, he paid a severe price for that. They kept waiting for him to finally get drunk. And uh, sure enough, the call came in to Hank Parker's office from honor dealers and, uh, Jimmy was up in the Boston area and was demanding money. And they knew what that meant was that he had relapsed. He was drunk and they just said, let him stew in his juices. And so uh, he had his own spiritual experience in a flea bag motel. Whenever they, he was getting stonewalled by the New Yorkers about his request for money or to get him home. And he thought, my God, even my own people have turned on me now. And so he made his way back to New York and uh, let himself into Hank Parker's house and uh, went to bed. And the next morning he woke up with a whole new attitude and openness about this higher power concept. 
This is Hank Parkhurst, unsung hero of Alcoholics Anonymous. Although Hank uh, died drunk and did not maintain continuous sobriety, without him, our book would have probably never been published. He pushed very hard on the fundraising effort in New York to get the funds raised. And one of his projects was to form a uh, bogus company called Works Publishing Incorporated. They went around selling stock certificates for $25 on a company that did not exist, on a book that had not been written. And if that's not alcoholic thinking, I don't know what is. But the most important part of this slide is, if you look carefully, in red pencil across here, it's written canceled. We bought back all of the bogus stock certificates that we sold uh, so no one could claim ownership of our book. We were actually, you know, when we were having trouble getting the book published, we considered, uh, we approached Harper Brothers, Bill did, about having them publish the book. And a guy named Eugene Exum said, Bill, we'll be glad to publish your book. We know it's going to sell. And I'll give, even give you an advance on it. But you might want to consider this. If we own your book, then we have editorial rights to change any of the wording in the book as we see fit if we think it'll sell more books. And that just did it for Bill. Absolutely not. They had been through enough wrangling and editorial by committee, and he felt like what was written was divinely inspired, and he wasn't about to sell out the book and give someone else, a publisher, the rights to change the wording of our book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, higher power. And also the other upside of that is we needed that revenue that we have had from rec from literature sales to keep general service afloat because it has never been supported by group contributions. It's always been uh, relied upon the sale of literature to keep GSO afloat. This is John D. Rockefeller Jr. His family was very much against liquor, alcohol. His job in life was to be a philanthropist, to give away money to, to uh, worthy causes. Leonard Strong, back to the beginning, brokered a deal through his acquaintance and uh, to get a meeting with John D. Rockefeller's people. He put on a dinner. I used to think it was a big banquet. Truth of the matter is it turns out there were 12 people present. <laughs> It was at Rockefeller Center, and there were two people from Akron, six Dr. Bob and one of his sponsees, six drunks from New York area, and then there were um, four people representing John D. Rockefeller. And the result of that was that he gave us five thousand dollars as a tied me over but felt like that if they gave us a great deal of money, it would, it would blow us up, that there would be fightings over money, status, prestige, and things of that sort. But he gave us brain power. And here we have Frank Amos, who was the treasurer at Riverside Church, and Willard Richardson, who was the person that arranged for the meeting in the first place at Leonard Strong's request. Frank Amos doled out the money, the $5,000 from the um, Riverside Church account to get Dr. Bob's house out of foreclosure and to give Bill a small uh, monthly stipend until the book could be completed and begin to get some royalty money coming in. They also set up the Alcoholic Foundation to have accountability for the money. This one brings tears to my eyes. It's just incredible. These are checks written on the Alcoholic Foundation to John D. Rockefeller Jr. and Charles B. Towns to repay them. To this day, to the best of my knowledge, we're the only organization that received grant money from the Rockefeller Foundation that ever paid it back. And in writing these checks, we gave the high sign to John D. Jr. and the Rockefellers by saying we got the concept of self-support through our own contributions. Seventh tradition in its early beginnings right here saying uh, we pay our own way and that way we're not beholding to any outside entities or people. Uh, just phenomenal. Now it was not, these were written in 1942 and 1943, uh, but that was the beginning of the seventh tradition. AA was outgrowing living, you know, meetings in homes. So uh, 
this was Miramar College where they were in financial hard times and AA rented a little small meeting place. It's this little door right down here next to the restaurant and bar. So each time you went there, I guess you stood at the turning point, right? Or if you're there wondering whether or not you were truly alcoholic, they can invite you next door to the nearest bar for some controlled drinking. Uh, but it, it, we, the point of this is we started having meetings in regular meeting places. This is the, um, uh, the clubhouse on 52nd street in New York city. It's offset from the, uh, the road a little bit. You see it, it's recessed and that hallway leading back there, they called it the last mile. It's the last mile you'll ever have to walk alone. And that's where Bill and Lois were living upstairs in this little apartment. They're homeless. Okay. They are homeless. They've been put out of Clinton street and uh, Bill was going through one of his bouts with depression and Tex comes up. It's a snowy stormy day. And Tex comes up and says, he's the, the doorkeeper, if you will, the club manager, and says, Bill, there's a guy to see you. And, and Bill was thinking, well, great. This is just what I need. Uh, send him up. And he heard this clumping noise and a struggle to get up the stairway. And, and then Bill just, of course, his magnifying mind says, oh, well, even better, a, a, a wet drum. This is just great. So he was real reluctant to receive this visitor, but it actually turned out to be this man, Father Ed Dowling, a Jesuit priest that came from St. Louis, Missouri, to talk to Bill about how he could articulate the exercises of Ignatius that he learned in priesthood school whenever he was learning to be ordained as a Jesuit priest. And he wasn't indeed drunk. He was crippled and he had a hard time getting up the staircase. So but he became a very good friend of Alcoholics Anonymous, one of our first advocates in religion and became a spiritual advisor to Bill and others in the fellowship. Now we fast forward to 1945, and this is a dinner that's being held to celebrate Dr. Bob's 10 year anniversary. Look at the photo closely. It looks like they're having a group sneeze. See all these napkins up in front of people's faces? They were starting to catch on about anonymity they knew that there was going to be a photo taken. And so they were trying to demonstrate that they were starting to get it 10 years in, but they're starting to get it about anonymity. And here's uh, Bill D, AA number three, Dr. Bob standing, and then Lois and Bill uh, 10 years in. Remaking of a Man by Courtney Baylor is very important in our AA history because it was a forerunner to Alcoholics Anonymous called the Emanuel Movement. And they were in the Northeast. And they were trying to work out ways for laymen to mentor or, if you will, sponsor alcoholics. Courtney Baylor's protege, Richard Peabody, wrote this book, The Common Sense of Drinking. It is in this book that Bill borrowed the, the story about the man that was doing spree drinking and remained bone dry until he retired. And out came the carpet slippers in the bottle and he drank himself to death. When you think about it, there'd been nobody sober around Alcoholics Anonymous for 25 years when our book was published. So Bill borrowed the story to make his point from Peabody on the common sense of drinking. Another widely read book was Twice Born Men. This could have been the inspiration for stories in the back of the book. This is about people that got sober at the turn of the century uh, in London, England through the Salvation Army. You know, our book says that we have no monopoly on recovery. And so these are very moving stories about how these people established their relationship with God and got sober. Another book that was on Dr. Bob's required reading list was The Greatest Thing in the World by Henry Drummond. And it's a dissertation about 1 Corinthians, about the greatest thing in the world is love. Another on Dr. Bob's required list for the people he sponsored by James Allen, As a Man Thinketh. And this was a follow-up on purity, absolute purity. What he was advocating is you clean up your thought life on the absolute purity. It's not purity of complexion, don't have pimples or anything. It's saying clean up your trashy thinking. And back in the early AAs, they had a slogan called stinking thinking leads to drinking. So as a man thinketh with some directions about cleaning up our thought life. Another book that was very helpful and a, a big point of Alcoholics Anonymous was the Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox. They called it the scientific way. It was a part of this movement that was going on that as a miracle happened for AA in the early 1900s, they called it experimental or experiential faith. 
instead of it being dogmatic and a doctrine that was imposed upon people, they just laid it out there and said, try it out, you know, see how it works for you. Another big Oxford group book that was very well read and has kind of slipped into obscurity was The Psychology of Christian Personality. They talked about experimental faith, the dynamic of fatherly love. He said, you know, Ligon said, this is not brotherly love. It's the love that a father has for his, for a child. Sibling rivalries will tell you brotherly love is not really the deal. It has to do about he's the father, we're the children. And he goes on to, uh, to enumerate about uh, the integration of our character with God's will for us. William James was the father of American psychology. His big contribution was this book, Varieties of Religious Experience. Now, if you're new to sobriety or even an old timer and you're struggling with, uh, with going to sleep, you're having trouble sleeping, get a copy of this book and keep it on your nightstand and pick it up and it will put you to sleep. This is an, a cure for insomnia. It's very dry. It's written very clinical. But the significance in AA history is Bill wasn't sure if he had had DTs or a hallucination in Bill in Towns Hospital. And when Abby brought him this book and he read through it, he found an exact description of what he ha had happened to him with the bright light, the mountaintop cool breeze experience. And so this was confirmation, at least for Bill, that it was not hallucinations or DTs, that it was indeed an actual religious conversion experience. <clears throat> God Calling was a book that was written by two spinster ladies that were members of the Oxford groups. And they would journal every morning about what they felt like God's direct message to them was. And it was just a big sheaf of papers. And uh, A.J. Russell, who wrote uh, for Sinners Only, he was kind of the journalist for the Oxford groups. He gathered them together and made a daily uh, devotional diary, a meditation book called God Calling, January 1st through December 31st. But see, the Oxford groups weren't anything about alcoholism. And so this man in the middle, Richmond Walker, he took it upon himself to write the 24 hours a day book. He would put the alcoholic, uh, the AA spin on the first section, a Reader's Digest convert, condensed version of the God calling for that day in the middle and tied the two together with a prayer for the day at the bottom. 24 hours a day is a big part of AA history because uh, it was second only to the big book in books published regarding recovery and sales and alcoholics for many, many, many years uh, have used the 24 hour a day book. It was offered to GSO. Richmond was publishing out of his basement. He was self-published out of Daytona Beach and the demand was overwhelming. He couldn't meet the demand. So he offered it to GSO. GSO reviewed it and said, look, Richmond, it's a great book but it's so obviously Judeo-Christian in its nature that if we accepted your gift and published and distributed it, it might imply that you had to be Christian to get sober in AA. And we don't want to put that message out there. So Richmond said, I'm not interested in money. He offered the book to Hazleton. They snapped it up, published it, and have sold more copies of it of anything they've ever published in the entire uh, history of the company. Richmond didn't care because all he wanted was to make it available to people. Jack Alexander was a writer for the Saturday Evening Post. They sent him out to follow the money on this Alcoholics Anonymous thing. They heard that they were tied in with the Rockefellers. He came to scoff, but he remained to pray. He wrote a moving article in Saturday Evening Post that let alcoholics know uh, that there was, a, there was hope. And he used this picture of a drunk being so shaky he had to winch the glass up to his mouth with a bar towel in order to get a drink. Alcoholics that saw that picture knew what that was about. 1949, we started um, getting some publicity through the comic strips. Leslie Turner in his, it was then called Wash Tubs, it was later called Captain Easy or Buzz Sawyer, right along with Dag, Dagwood and Blondie and Beetle Bailey. Well, here's this comic strip that goes through a series of panels that was syndicated nationally that showed a drunk hitting bottom, getting 12 step by a couple of members of Alcoholics Anonymous. 
getting a sponsor, working the steps, and then it finally resolved in the last uh, of the panels that went out about him, the man being sober and reconciling with his young daughter that he had been forbidden to see over his drinking. So we found out we could carry the message in the comics as well. We started having general service conferences and here's Bill at the, at the podium and he's starting to turn over the controls of AA to the general service conference. We wound up evol evolving into three different sets of 12 and it was mentioned at the first of this meeting. And once again, that, that lit me up when Steve was talking about this group pays attention to the three 12s, okay? Consider this one. The first set of 12s, powerless is the problem and power is the solution and th steps three through 11 are the action that we take. The fruit that it bears is a spiritual awakening. That's for the individual. Then as we moved along, the traditions came about. The problem was maintaining unity. The solution was God and our group conscience. Then traditions three through 11 are non-actions. See, just the, in the inverse of the steps, three through 11 are things that we do not do because of their negative impact on unity. And then the 12th one is that fruit that it bears is spiritual anonymity, where who we are is not as important as what we do. Then later the concepts, the third set of 12s came out in our history about how to express ourselves at the service level. The solution was the general service conference and three through 11 are interaction that are used to bear fruit in the form of the warranties for collective worldwide AA. So we've got three sets of 12. One is based in actions, the, the second set of non-actions, and the third guidance for interaction at the service level. We started producing pamphlets. Then one fine day, we had this aha moment. There's drunks dying around the world that do not read or speak English. You know, well, what are we gonna do about them? GSO made a commitment to translate the big book into foreign languages. And it's an incredible, well-used uh, source of our, our funding to make the book available for non-English non -English speakers that desperately need the big book message and in their native tongue where they can read and understand it. Phenomenal undertaking. When the one millionth big book was printed and came off the uh, press, this is Dr. Jack Norris, who's the non-alcoholic chairman of the board of GSO. He presented that book to the then president, Richard Milhouse Nixon. If you notice the book is open, and I think Dr. Jack might've been drawing Nixon's attention to the page that says it demands rigorous honesty. I'm not really sure, but I, 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 that, that may be the page that they're looking at there. This is Marty Mann. She's critical in AA history because she broke through the double standard uh, about women not being welcome in Alcoholics Anonymous. The wives were afraid that there was gonna be extramarital sex going on. There was a double standard that men had alcoholism and women were immoral. And so Marty Mann was one of the first women with continuous long-term sobriety that helped open the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous for women. And uh, she later had embarked on a career of, of public information through Yale University and the National Council on Alcoholism Education. Yale was trying to promote Bill Wilson to endorse the disease concept. And if you look closely in our textbook, Bill sidesteps the word disease entirely regarding alcoholism. He does not call it a disease. He calls it an illness, sickness, or a malady. But Dr. Jelnick at Yale came up with this disease concept so doctors could get paid to treat us. Bill said, that's an outside issue upon which we have no opinion. We cannot embrace the disease concept and make it part of AA. Ailes and, and Dr. Jelnick and Yale said, well, how about this, Bill? I know you're kind of sensitive about uh, not completing college. How about if we give you an honor, honor, honorary doctoral from Yale University? if you'll just embrace this disease concept. And Bill is like, I'd love to be, have a doctorate from Yale, but not at the expense of the fellowship, embracing an outside uh, issue 
like the disease concept. But so thanks, but no thanks. And that's how we avoided that conflict about trying to embrace calling alcoholism a disease. His own words were that illness, sickness, and malady is a much safer term for us to use. This is Harry Tebow, who was our friend, first uh, friend in psychiatry, and he has some very interesting observations about Alcoholics Anonymous and our program of recovery. He was a very humble man. He basically wrote professional letters to the psychiatric community saying, the best we can do as psychiatrists is keep these drunks alive long enough to steer them to AA. They've got the goods. That's the place for them to get well. It all led back to that initial meeting whenever Ebby brought that message of hope to Bill at Clinton Street in New York. Bill, in turn, carried that message to Dr. Bob in Akron. Now, tip of the hat to our common solution group and all the groups around the world that embrace the, the same values that you do. Imagine, can you remember here recently, there was a pharmacist that was arrested for selling watered down cancer drugs to terminally ill cancer patients. And there was big outrage. People like that guy needs to be thrown underneath the jail. How could someone possibly do that? But when we look in the mirror, we have to ask ourselves this, are we not guilty of the same thing of delivering a watered down AA message instead of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous? We can always return to the textbook to have an objective viewpoint about what the true program of recovery is as it's laid out in our textbook. Thank you all so much. I know it's been a long, a long ride, but I appreciate the opportunity and uh, God bless you all. I love you guys.